is. Well, we started uh, last week a series on stewardship. <clears throat> I said it would be stewardship month, but it's going to spill over into the month of October. So September and October is going to be stewardship months. And we're using the word stewards, S-T-E-W-A-R-D-S. Last week, we started with letter S. Letter S stood for, does anybody remember? Letter S stood for self. self. We looked at the definition of a steward. The definition of a steward to me is one of my favorite definitions of any word that we have in our English language. The word steward is a man employed in great families to manage the domestic concerns, superintend the other servants, collect the rents or income, keep the accounts, and etc. Meaning a steward has a lot of responsibilities. And so last week we looked at the word steward, but only letter S, which stood for self. So we looked at the definition, a man. Now the whole definition, again, a man employed in great families to do everything for the master of the house. But we looked at specifically a man. And we looked at ourselves, and what we cut off at the end was our conclusion. Our conclusion is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, last week we looked at ourselves. We listened to the message. We examined ourselves. We weren't thinking about anybody else. We were trying to say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? It's about me, self. What do you want me to do for you? We looked just briefly in Sunday school about Moses. And God said to Moses, what's in your hand? I've given you something to steward. What is in your hand? Oh, this rod, this stick? Yeah, throw it on the ground. And we read a little bit of that in Sunday school. And so God has given all of us talents, abilities, gifts, what are we doing with those? So we looked at that a little last week, and we concluded with prayer, but we didn't look at 1 Corinthians 6 <clears throat> until the afternoon service. But I thought it would be good to recap 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. We're not going to go in great detail like we did last week in our afternoon service, but this is just to get us off the runway. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. So Paul is telling Corinthians, now, if you only had two options this morning to say that the church at Corinth was a good godly church or a little bit of a mess, which one would you choose? Probably a little bit of a mess. Well, Paul is writing this church and he says, dare any of you individually having a matter against another individual in the church, go to the court system, the law, before the unsaved crowd, the unjust, and not before the saints. So Paul is saying, I'm addressing all of these things in the book of Corinthians, but one of the things I need to address is if you ever get the idea to go to court with another believer in the church, there's a problem. Don't do that. Look at verse 2. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, saints, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matter? Paul is saying, can't you figure it out within the church? Verse 3, know ye not that we shall judge the angel or judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? And so we use a rather silly example last week we said angel, who is how old? 11? 12. 12, that's what I said. He's just my son. Uh, 12 years old. He's 12 years old. He cannot legally drive. But he decides to drive to church anyway. And he comes to church and he hits Brother Daniel's vehicle. And he hits it so bad that it just, the whole bumper falls off. Now we looked at this last week, but for those who weren't here, we have an issue. 
angel hits Daniel's vehicle. So Daniel comes out after hearing the crash, and he's like, oh, man, you hit my bumper, angel. And angel's like, and you shouldn't have parked there. And he comes into church to worship the Lord. Wow. And Daniel's a little bit upset. And this is his vehicle. So he goes, Angel, now we're inside and we don't know what happened. But Daniel comes in and says, Angel, are, are you going to do anything about it? I mean, that's my vehicle. And then Angel says, you're right. That's your vehicle. Fix it. Just as. And he goes on worshiping the Lord. There would be a problem, by the way. But we're not going to address that side. So the reality is this. Daniel's so upset. Angel won't listen. Daniel even comes to me and says, Pastor, I hate to do this to you. You are about to preach. And I'm like, then don't do it to me. <laughs> tell me later. But Daniel's like, I have to tell you. Angel hit my bumper and he tells me everything that he, I just told you. And now we have a problem. And I'm like, Daniel, all I care about right now is the glory of God. And I want to preach with power. Get away from me. And Daniel's like, what in the world? And so finally, we get weeks later, nobody has done anything in fixing the problem. But Daniel can't afford to fix his vehicle. And his insurance says you've got to pay the deductible. And the insurance says, why don't the person who hit you, they are, are liable to pay the deductible. Uh, no, so I'm going to take them to court. And Paul says, we shouldn't do that as a church. Look at your Bible, verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Paul is saying, if angel really didn't hit Daniel's vehicle and break it, why don't you get someone who's least esteemed? Someone who has no, if you will, skin in the game to figure it out. So we get the guy who's just kind of clueless. That's AC. And so we go to AC and we're like, AC, you have no skin in the game. And we tell him the scenario and AC says, well, Angel, you need to pay for the repairs. Paul is saying, don't you have someone within the church? Look at your Bible, verse 5. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you inside of the church? No, no. Not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? Verse 7. Again, we're talking about stewardship. This was last week talking about us, ourselves, individually. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you. Because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? You know what Paul just said? Daniel, I know it's a bummer that he hit your bumper and he destroyed it, but you're just, yeah, take wrong. Don't take them to court, the unjust, the heathen, don't do it. Take wrong. Look at your Bible, verse number seven. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you. It's not that angel hit the vehicle and broke the bumper. The fault is you're taking things outside of the church to a lost and dying world. Look at your Bible, verse seven. Now, therefore, there's utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather, what's that next word? Why do ye not rather suffer, suffer yourselves to be rut? You know what Paul is saying in our silly illustration? Daniel, you're right. You were wrong. But be a man of God. On Monday nights, we have Man Up Monday. Man up. Take it right on the chin. For God. That's what he says. Look at your Bible again, verse 7. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Verse 8. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brother. So now we've made two wrong. He's wrong, Daniel. Daniel's wrong the church by going and defrauding his brother, going to court. And we can get into more detail, but I'm trying to get off the runway here. Verse 9. Know ye that, excuse me, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers 
of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But here's the key where we're going to stop in our introduction here, verse 11. And such were some of you. You know what Paul says? The world's a mess. The church has issues because it's filled with people. Where there's people, there's problems. And so the church has issues, but where there's problems in the church, the church ought to have someone wise among them that can go ahead and stand up and say, hey, let me intervene there. Matthew 18 would be a good commercial break here that we're not going to take. But when you're offended, it's going to happen. You go to him and him alone. And if you're spiritual, you've gained a brother. And actually, it's amazing. When you hurt someone or you are hurt by someone and there's healing there, you actually are closer to that individual. I'm blown away by that truth, but the reality is I've been married 24 years, and I have heard her many, many, many times. But because of her forgiveness, it's like it brought us closer. Now, well, let's hurt each other so we can be brought closer. No, that's not how it works. But the reality is when offenses come and they will come, it's a promise, there's a way to deal with it. And Paul is saying, hey, you as a church, Solid Rock, should be able to take care of the affairs of Solid Rock. Don't go out to the heathen. Look at verse 9 again. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither, and he gives this list, verse 11, and such were some of you. Don't think so highly of yourself this morning. You were just like them. You were just like them. Know ye not? And such were some of you. But the difference is you're watched. Answer this yourself in your heart. Letter S. Are you saved? If you were to die today, God forbid, but if you were to die today, are you washed in the blood of the... I did not ask if you were sinless. I didn't ask if you were baptized. I didn't ask, I didn't ask, I didn't ask. I said, are you saved? And, and stewardship starts with a man employed in great families. That's what it says, steward. A man employed... In great families, are you part of the family of God? You've got to examine yourself. And Paul looks at the church, born again, baptized believers. He said, such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified. We used a cup last week. And we said when we have a dirty cup, we wouldn't want to drink out of that. So we take it and we wash it, and then we put it where? Put it in the... Covered in the cabinet, we put it away. Why? We have sanctified it, and now that cup is meat. It is ready for when you need it. You open the cabinet, you get it, and it's clean. You don't go, man, I'm thirsty, and you go to the dishwasher that hasn't been ran yet. You don't go there and go, oh, yuck, and you use it anyway. No, that's disgusting. Angel, don't do that. I'm just kidding. But no, we don't do that. We go to the cupboard where the clean ones are. They've been sanctified. We as believers, if we are saved, look at get a verse 11, such were some of you. Well, what was the difference? You're washed. You are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Now, we could keep going, but that was last week. As stewards, we have to understand that we are born again. If you were to die today, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? If you are saved then you have been employed in great family, in a great family. We sing the song around here. I'm so glad I'm a part of the what? Of the family. family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this song. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. A steward is a man employed in a great family. So letter T this morning. Letter S stood for what? Self. Self. It's all about examining yourself, your walk with the Lord. Letter T stands for time. We're just going to look at time a little this morning, not near what I would like to. Letter T stands for time. Again, the definition of a steward is a man. We looked at that last week. Self. A man. But it continues. Employed in great families to manage to manage the domestic concerns, superintend the other servants, and collect the rents or income, keep the accounts, and etc. All of that 
All the responsibilities of a steward requires time. Time. So we're going to look at time in our text, 1 John chapter number 3. This morning we're going to only go down to verse 10. So verses 1 through 10 this morning of our text. We do have a commercial break in Ecclesiastes here in a little bit. But here we go. Letter T stands for time. If you're taking notes, number one this morning, we're going to start off and see the family. Chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 John. The family. Behold, what manner of love the Father... It could have said God. It could have said... It would have been accurate. But the idea here in verse 1, I'll read the rest. What manner of love the Father... We're talking about stewardship, specifically the stewardship of our time this morning, and understand that you and I, as born-again, blood-bought, saved folk, and if you're not saved, we can get that dealt with today, but if you're saved, you are part of the family of God, and we have the same Father. And the Bible says in verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Today, this weekend, Bellflower has yard sale weekend. And so there's a lot of yard sales going on here in Bellflower. And, and one, of the, one of the hardest things for us, we have in our city yard sale weekends, four weekends a month, so one a quarter. And I believe... Technically, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I think. I don't think they want Thursday. I don't think they want Monday. And they're, they're strict with different rules and things, and it's sad. I don't want to chase that rabbit. Let me take off my American flag and put on my Christian flag. I'll just stay here at church. And uh, it's sad, though, that last yard sale we had, they went around the city, of which I reminded him, I said, you understand your payroll comes from our taxes. I just want to remind you. And I'm making money so that I can live. And, and they went and took down our signs and other people's signs around our neighborhood because they only wanted a sign in front of your home. And I asked them, I said, do they do that for real estate? Oh, that's different. We, we, whoa, whoa, why is that different? They're selling something, trying to get people to come to their property. I actually live here. I'm not trying to make money off of, you know, I'm trying to do things here for our neighborhood, for my family, etc. And so I went through a few things back and forth. And I asked him, I said, um, do you understand we're literally doing this just to eat? Like we're just using this to pay for our bills and to take care of our family. And the city says we can only do it four days or four weekends a year. When it was all said and done, he said, oh, leave my signs alone. Just please make sure you pick them up. I said, thanks, that'd be great. And then we went on our day. But I got thinking, every time we have a yard sale weekend, we never do it on Sunday. Now, at our yard sales, we, it helps us pay for our homeschool material. It helps us pay, he mentioned ISC, which was in Missouri. That's a long drive, a lot of gas. These yard sales help us raise the funds to keep books and all the school material and all the instruments and all. And so not doing Sunday is a big deal financially. And on the way to church, if you notice, there's yard sales all over in Bellflower. And last time I checked, Sunday is the Lord's day. It's not the Lord's hour either. It's the Lord's day. And we try to give him the whole day. And as much as a dad, as I look at the finances and I look, we have like nine students in our home and, and all the materials and all the stuff and the instruments and the lessons and this and this and that and all the fees. Four Sundays a year isn't that much when you think of 52 in a year. So if you start reasoning in your mind, well, it's just, you know, we can only do it once a quarter. And you know what we'll do? Well, half of us will come to church because, we, Lord, you know my heart. And we start reasoning out God. And that's a shame. We are stewards of our time. But we are not authors of our time. Hebrews 12 says he is the author and finisher of our what? Okay, we're going to talk about faith here in a little bit, really soon. But let me finish point number one, the family. Look at verse one again. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, 
You say, why don't you tell us about the yard sale weekend? Well, on Sundays, or excuse me, on Fridays and Saturdays, almost every yard sale my wife has asked, and some of you have seen pictures, we don't have a little rinky-dink. I mean, it's like better than your local Walmart at our house on our yard sales. And, and they always ask Sherry, are you guys going to be here tomorrow? And in, inevitably, she says, no, we're going to church or whatever. And sometimes we don't tell them because we don't want them to know we're not home and then they'll break in and steal all of our stuff. Um, so we just, oh, no, we're, we're not open tomorrow. But we give them tracks. Every, almost everyone that comes gets a track. They're coming to my property. Might as well invite them to church or at least let them know who Jesus is. And my point is, I'm not in charge of my time. God is. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. You, you can't wake up in the morning and just decide, what am I going to do, and leave it at that. Lord, what will thou have me to do is a great thing that Saul said in Acts chapter 9. What do you want me to do, Lord, with my time, talent, treasure, etc., etc., etc.? So T stands for time, and we are to manage the domestic concerns, superintend the other servants, collect the rents or income, keep the accounts, etc., etc., Etc. Look at the end of verse 1. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. If there's people doing a yard sale this weekend, and we invited them to church, and they said, you know, I would come, but we've got a yard sale. And I'm thinking, do you understand that God will supply all your need? If you trust and obey him? I, learned, I was so excited, because we're at the beginning of a month. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing. I've been in church almost all of my life. I love filling these out. I mean, I actually enjoy it. Now, I used to do it because that's just what you do. When I first had a job, I was 16, worked at Baskin Robbins here in Buena Park, and I, I wrote my time check. Started to give it a mission, did it. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I just did it. That's why I was taught no big deal. But somewhere along the way, I actually got a hold of God loveth a cheerful giver. And, and before I got happy about it, I started to get sad about how much I don't really give. Specifically to missions. And I got thinking, I mean, I'm giving, but that's not much. And then God reminded me, you're part of the church. So collectively, it's a lot. But as an individual, you might think, well, it's not much. I don't know if I should. No, no, no. We steward everything, and we're going to address that later. But on Sunday, I, I get excited about writing a check and putting it in the offering plate and giving back to the Lord a portion of what he's given to me. And the reality is it's all his anyway. That's stewardship. And so we've got this family. You are part. If you're saved, you're part of the family of God. You're a steward, a man employed in great families. Number two this morning. We're only going to verse 10. Number two this morning, verse 2, the faith. The faith. Verse 2 says, beloved, now are we the sons of God, right? Now. And it doth not appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Yeah. Has anyone in this room, and I'll help you, the answer is no. Has anyone in this room ever physically seen Jesus? I already told you the answer, no. So if you thought it was yes, I saved you the embarrassment. But if you think it's yes, come see me after and I'll, I'll love to talk to you. And, and tell you why you're wrong. But by faith, I'm looking forward to seeing him face to face. Go over to Hebrews 11. We're building on stewardship. But we have to understand, one, if we're saved, we're part of this amazing great family. And if we're saved, we ought to be living by faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this. Now, faith is the substance. I was telling Brother Daniel before the service, that word substance, if you think of a cake, just tell me some ingredients. Let's keep engaged here. What are some ingredients in a cake? Flour, Flour eggs, sugar. 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 Sky, we say sugar. All the ingredients. Sky's like, sugar? She hasn't listened to the whole service, but she was ready for that. So you've got to say it again. Flour, eggs, sugar, salt, salt. Vanilla abstract. Mm -hmm. I heard baking powder, milk. Is that? In my cake, there's milk. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, those are the ingredients that make up the cake. Or at least there, there may be more, etc., etc. 
The thing that makes up faith, look at your Bible. Now, faith is made up by the ingredient, the substance, this is what faith is, of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So AC, let's go back to our trial. AC is brought into court to testify for Daniel about Angel hitting his car. And the judge says, AC, did you see it happen? No. Well, what evidence do you have that it I, I wasn't there? Well, the judge will say, well, you're dismissed. You're not a good witness. If you don't have any actual physical proof touching evidence, you're not a good witness. As a believer, I don't have any actual physical, like here's a photo of Jesus. What I have is faith, and the world makes so much fun of that reality. Because at the end of the day, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Why? Because I do that by faith. And they want to touch it. They want to see it. I mean, Jesus addressed that. You guys want a sign? You don't need a sign. In fact, we have a more sure word. Yeah. And so look at your Bible, verse, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things I see. I have not physically seen Jesus, but I talked to him today. Yeah. Like I, I actually engaged him today. We said on Thursday night that we're over here and we don't really know what to say. And the Holy Spirit goes, God, and he goes to our advocate, who then goes to the judge, and we haven't really said anything, we're just, we're just in his presence, we're trying to pray, and we want to say, we don't even know what to say, and there's times the Holy Spirit says, I hear you clearly. I know he's alive. He said, well, what evidence do you have? Now, there's things that have happened in my life that the world would call a coincidence, well, that just, the stars align. Well, first of all, he created the stars also. But I, I, I've talked to him. Like, I know he's real. So what evidence? I mean, I need actual court-approved evidence. And we can use science. We can, uh, But at the end of the day, it's faith. I just take him at his word. I just believe him. Well, what's his word? Right here. I have his preserved word right here in the King James Bible. Like, that's a big deal. Well, why do you believe? I can argue, but what's the point? I can earnestly contend for the faith. That's great, but I'm not going to argue. But I'm just boiling down to the word faith. I just believe God. I believe God. How? By faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Was anyone there at creation? No. We believe that by faith, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And we can keep going down to Genesis 1. Why do you believe that? By faith. By faith, look at verse 3. Through faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do shazam appear. No. There's no big bang unless you're using the word of God and bang it happened. There's no big bang. They have faith as well. But their faith hasn't found a resting place. Ours has found a resting place. Verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, I do want you to answer out loud by a, a raise of hand out loud, signify by a raise of hand. How many of you would like Enoch's testimony that you please God? How many? My hand's up. I would like to please God. Okay, well, how do we do that? Keep reading. I'm glad you asked. But without faith, verse 6, it is impossible. 
to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. I like that. That He is is just like I am. That He is what? Yeah. I am what? Yeah. Fill in the blank. What, what do you need? Salvation? He is. You need healing? He is. You need more faith? Yeah, that's what the disciples said. You want us to forgive our brothers? Yeah, but he hit my bumper and destroyed my bumper on my car. Yeah, 70 times 70. Oh. Lord, would you increase our faith? He is. He is. Look at your Bible, verse number 6 again. Believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This month and next month included, we're looking at stewardship. How are you doing with your time? We're going to get to it. I've got to hurry up. The pizza, I think, is ordered. Verse 3. Maybe not yet, hopefully. The verse 3, good. Verse 2, she told me, no, we got 45 more minutes. Just kidding. Verse 3, the focus. The focus. They focus, preacher. The focus. So we've got the family. We're a man employed in great families. We are to live by faith, for without it, it's impossible to please him. The world doesn't get it, by the way. They just don't get it. They don't get it. I'm telling you, our yard sales are a big deal for a year. They are a big deal. And we need them to help us keep doing what we're doing in our home. But at the same time, Sunday's a bigger deal. I'm not giving up four Sundays a year. I, I hate missing this church. I do get to preach out from time to time, but I love this place. Last week, Sunday school was undescribable. I have never in my life experienced what I experienced last Sunday here in Sunday school. And we just open up the floor. Anybody? I've never done that. That is so not Baptist. It's crazy. And I said, does anybody want to sing? Just come up and sing. And what do we have? Ten? We have ten specials. Like we never do that. And we may never do it again, so don't ask. That was the most unbaptistic thing I've ever done. It was awesome. And the Lord just blew in and then we cried and we laughed and the altar and we're just... And God just showed up. Why would I put a yard sale above that? Why would I assume that it's just another Sunday? Why would I do that with my time that's not actually my time? It's his. I'm going to mess this up. I always want to quote it, but one day I need to write it down. Yesterday is gone. That's why they call it the past. Tomorrow isn't here yet. That's why they call it the future. But today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. I don't know how much longer 14 heralds are going to live under the same roof. But my children are not my children. I am stewarding them. And there's things happening behind the scenes. And I'm going, Lord, they're not mine. But please have your will and your way. No one needs my children in their church more than I do. But everywhere we go, hey, how's he, how old, how's he doing? Can I hire him? Can I hire her? Can I take them? I'm thinking, do you know what size our church is? But it's not my church. I'm just a steward. And so if God wants to move pieces, not my will, but thine be done. I'm just responsible to be that lighthouse that stands and watches everybody else move about as God has called them to. Stewardship of time. I've said it often with Acts chapter 2. And suddenly, that wasn't suddenly to God. Pentecost wasn't like, oh, is that today? No, God knows what he's doing. It's suddenly to us. I'm not beating up Thomas for missing church that day when Jesus showed up. We call him Doubting Thomas, but the Bible doesn't. Abel preached a great message on that a little bit ago. The Bible doesn't call him Doubting Thomas, but he wasn't there that Sunday, and they were like, Tommy, you missed it. And Thomas said, if I put my hands in his, you know, I'll believe. Then he shows up the next Sunday, and Jesus showed up, and he didn't have to put his hands in. He said, my Lord... And my God. And Jesus said, there's going to be people who haven't even seen me and believe. That's us. By faith. So the focus, verse 3. The focus. Listen to this. And, 1 John 3, 3. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies.
glorifieth himself. That means you and I have a job to do. Our focus, keep looking at verse 3. Every man that hath this hope in him purifies it even as he is pure. I said last week, stewardship starts with self, but it continues with a value and understanding of time. Time. Oh, I really don't want to do this for the sake of time, but let's go ahead. I already told you anyway. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're just going to quickly read this, verses 1 through 8. Our focus has to be on our own personal walk with God. Yes, I want to encourage my, my oldest son, Chanel. I want, oh, daughter Chanel. I always call her my oldest son as a joke. That just slipped out. She's my oldest son. But my oldest daughter, Chanel, my oldest child. I, I, I want to encourage her to read her Bible. I want to encourage her to pray. I want to fill in the blank. I want to, I want, I want, I want, I want. But the best thing I can do is live it before her. If she sees me in the Word and she sees me smiling and she sees me crying and she sees me up and she sees me uh, humbled, she sees me, and she's thinking, I want that. That's attractive. The Holy Spirit inside of her will work on that. And I can tell her, did you read your Bible today? Did you read your Bible? Did you read your Bible? Did you read your Bible? And she can think, does he ever read his? I mean, it's, I'm going to say those things, but I'd rather show it. And so our focus has to be on our walk first. Look at Ecclesiastes. Again, stewardship starts with self, but it continues with the value and understanding of time. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1 through 8. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I read that too fast. Let me reread it again. To every thing there is a season. And a, what's that next word? And a time. time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born. And a time to die. A time to plant. And a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. The passage continues, but what I wanted to stress on is the stewardship of your time. There are things that will attack your time. We're going to highlight that at the end. Go back to 1 John, look at verse 4. We're only getting to verse 10. We're getting closer. Look at verse 4. The temptation. The temptation. I'm going to read verse 4. But we will be tempted to misuse our time to fulfill our own selfish desires and ignore the stewardship of our time. Look at verse 4. 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And so in the area of our time, we can be good stewards of it or we can be bad stewards of it. So it can either be pleasing to the Lord or it can be pleasing to ourself only. And when we please the Lord, it is pleasing to ourselves. It's kind of enjoyable to make the Lord smile, to obey Him and trust Him and walk in His steps. But there's times when we put ourselves on the throne and we fall into the temptation to sin. Look at verse 4 again. Whoso committed sin 
transgresseth also the law. You say, well, what is the sin in time? Well, there's a time to love and a time to hate. You understand the world doesn't get that? What the world has done is they said, there's only a time to love and let me define what love is. They don't have a biblical definition of love. Therefore, whatever they say is love is love. And the only one that's hating is those who are actually biblically loving. And so we'll be tempted to use our time in a way that is more conducive to what we think than to what God says and is shared in his word. I'm going to get to this at the end. So the temptation, let's move on. Number five, verse five and six, the triumph. The triumph. Verse five. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. You have to go back to 1 John chapter one, which we were back in January but you've got to go back to understand who he's writing to and why he's writing. You've got to remember all those things we've covered this year. But right now he reminds them what he said back in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through. What he says here in verse number, where are we at? Five? Mm -hmm. Verse number five, the Bible says, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever, what is that next word? Whosoever. Five. Okay, that was a big deal last week. Remember that? I think three times, maybe four, we looked at abide it, abide it, self, abide it, abide it. Well, he brings that back up here at verse number six. Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. My dad used to say it this way. You can't smell like a rose and run around with skunks. Can't do it. And I didn't get it. I was a teenager, so in one ear, maybe, if it went in, it fell out the other. Most of the time, it just didn't get through. But he taught me, you are who your friends are. You can't say you want to be a good Christian and run around with people who aren't trying even to be a good Christian. And here the Bible says in verse 6, Whoso, Whosoever abideth in him, sinneth not. Next time you're tempted to use your eyes, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Next time you're tempted to use your eyes to see something wicked, you kids call your mom and dad. Let's pretend this is a screen, and I'm going to use this screen to look at something wicked. But I'm over here, and nobody can see what's on my screen. Before you look at whatever you're about to look at, just say, hey, Dad, come here, and see if you still look at it. What a mature believer does is understand, even though no one's looking, our Father's looking. And if you're abiding with Him, you don't even want the device, let alone what you are about to click on. And the Holy Spirit of God is saying, look, I want to rule and reign in your life, but you're stiff arming me. You're resisting me. Look at your Bible, verse 6. Whoso, but if you're abiding in him, you won't sin. Sin it not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So it's a big deal. We looked at 1 Corinthians 611, and such were some of you. First Corinthians, I have this written down. You don't have to turn there. First Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You ever feel like you're the only one who struggles with this, whatever the this is? In fact, I'm the only one that struggles with this. I go to church and everyone's like, they're all this, that, and the other. And I'm just, I'm just not like it. Maybe I should quit. I, I have struggles they don't even get. They don't even have a clue. The Word of God says there have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And so although the temptation is there, you can have triumph through Jesus Christ. And we're getting to the end of this toward the time. So let's go to verse 7. The test. The test. I love this all through the book of 1 John. Little children. I love how he says that. Little children, let no man deceive you. You know what I love about our church, whether it's me or whoever we have preaching? They always say, look at your Bible, look at your Bible, look at verse this, look at verse this, look at your Bible, look at your Bible. We don't spend a lot of time in Fluffville. We keep going, look at your Bible, look at your Bible, look at your Bible. Why? 
because we don't want to deceive and we don't use one verse twisted and figure out, no, 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 we're trying to stay. This is why it's, it's September and we're only in 1 John 3. And I was supposed to finish all three letters this year. Yeah. Wow. Little children, let no man deceive you. This, uh, if I didn't tell you, is the test. Verse 7, the test. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. I call this the test because when you now we're getting closer to this time emphasis. Everyone is given 24 hours a day. What are you going to do with your time? You're either going to, verse 7, do with righteousness, or you're going to do with evil. With your time. Like there's only two choices, somebody said, on the shelf, pleasing God and pleasing self. What are you going to do with your time? Life is a vapor. Brother Mershon is here this morning. I, I feel I'm in my mid-40s, Brother Mershon, and I, I feel like my life is close to ending. And I don't mean tomorrow. I just it's, it's just vapor. And yet I look a few more laps ahead of me is where you are. But I'm sure that you're like vapor. And I look at the age of these young boys and I'm thinking, yo, that was like two seconds ago. Time just goes. And so I want to encourage you this morning to steward your time wisely. I was praying yesterday, Lord, I want to make sure I am making much of you with those that I'm around. Had a pastor call me yesterday for prayer about a specific thing in a phone call he had to make. And after we hung up, I thought, man, that is so awesome that I got called to pray with someone who thought highly enough of me that I would actually pray. And I've got other people who might still say, like they did when I was in the military, you go to church? I was wearing clothes yesterday that I thought, you know, is this what I'm supposed to be wearing? I was just running to the store to get some, some things for uh, last night. But I looked at myself, I thought, is this really the right type of dress that I'm supposed to be wearing? He said, oh, come on, Pat. No. What do you mean, oh, come on? I'm going to give an account. I am a steward in a great family. Was I reflecting that in yesterday's attire? And the answer is no. You don't even know what I was wearing. But I, was, I, I looked at myself and I thought, this isn't it. Not as a steward. Not as a believer. I mean, you've got people in the black and white movie days that are criminals, crooks, drugs, all the movies, the thugs, the, the gangsters of the movies who dress better than I am right now. And they're wicked. And I go to the store to get some eggs and milk or whatever, and I look like, I don't, I'm telling you, I wouldn't look at me and go, yeah, that's a preacher. That's a man of God. That's a child of God. I would just think, he should have taken a shower before he left. Wherever he was, I wouldn't think anything about God. Matthew 5, 13 or Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men. It's so easy to do it here on Sunday. Oh, how I love Jesus. What about when you're going to get milk? Are we not supposed to let her, are we going to, oh, we're getting milk. I'll just wear this, it's okay. You've got to hide it under a bushel. Our time covers every aspect of our life. And we're, quote, unquote, running out of time because our vapor, life is just a vapor. And so with whatever time I have left, I want my light to shine. Why? So I can bring others forward on their journey. I'm looking forward to taking my family down here to the apartments and singing to Miss Cindy, happy birthday. And, and I, I hope we're able to go into a room if she's able to be decent and I don't think she'll be in the wheelchair at the time. And, but if she can't see us, she's going to hear us. And we're going to sing. In an apartment complex that has 20 plus, they're all going to hear us. And we're going to sing. So what are you doing? Showing off? No, I'm just I'm trying to encourage a sister, one, in Christ. Two, we're going to let our light shine. We could easily just deliver the card and give her some flowers and say, we love you, we miss you, let us know if you need anything. Be ye warmed and filled. Or 
we could actually take the church to her, of whom she would love to be. Every time she comes, she loves it, but she can't physically. She had a horrible day yesterday. And she can't, she's shut in, she can't. So we can go to her. It's just an example, but our time, our time, verse 7 again, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness. He's writing saved people. They're already saved. But as believers, good stewards of our time, we're going to do righteousness. Well, what is that? Examine yourself. Ask the Lord, what will I have me to do? And maybe God will say, what's in your hand? Oh, this rod? Yeah, I want to use that rod. Later you're going to call it the rod of God. It's a big deal. Time doeth righteousness. You're either doing righteousness or you're doing wickedness. You say, well, it's just idle time. There's no such thing. You're going to give an account. If we're going to give an account of every idle word, then we're going to give an account of every idle time spent doing quote-unquote nothing. I believe in rest, and I think we're going to get to that. But if you don't come apart, you'll soon come apart, somebody said. And God schedules these things, and we're going to look at that, I believe, here at the end. So we've got the test. The test is, are you, with your time, doing righteousness? Or are you doing wickedness? The Bible says, verse 8 and 9, the flesh. I just skipped word. I cannot believe I just said the flesh. Somebody come up with a T word that has to do with flesh. I don't know how I did that, but it's the flesh. It is what it is. Wow, how did I do that? The oh, well. Treacherous. Verse 89, what? I said the treacherous. The, the, tre the treacherous. I like flesh. It's easier to spell. <laughs> verse 8 and 9. Look at our flesh. We're only going to verse 10. We're almost there. I totally skipped to letter F, and then the last point is letter F as well. That's hilarious. The flesh. Look at verse 8 and 9. Verse 8. The Bible's inspired, not my notes. Yeah. Verse 8. The flesh. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Of God. Now there's a lot of, to dissect, but we're only going to look at the word commit or committed. The word commit means to give in trust, to put into the hands or power of another, to entrust with or to. And so the Bible says, he that committeth sin is of the devil. Here's the two options to keep it as simple as I can this morning. Your life, quote unquote, your life, it's his, bought you, purchased, etc., but your life, you have a choice every morning to give it back to God or commit it to the devil. Like, that's it. You're either committing your works to the Lord, committing your time to the Lord, stewarding your life that way, or you're committing it to the devil. There's a lot more we can look at and all these things, but the word commit means to give and trust. So when we commit, let me give you two verses. I've got my notes. Psalm 37, 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord, Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. And so we wake up every day and we have an opportunity to commit our way, commit our works to the Lord. And we won't sin. Now, are we sinless? Absolutely not. Our flesh is not saved. It's not. There's always going to be a conflict and a struggle. But when the temptation to sin comes, he's made a way of escape. Because we've submitted to him and we've given him good stewardship of our life, then we won't do the things we're not supposed to do. Because we acknowledge that he's there, he's present, etc., etc. And so understand we have this constant battle with our flesh. I wanted to read Romans 6. We're not going to do it for the sake of time. But there's this back and forth. Committing our, uh, we're dead to sin. We shouldn't live any longer therein. And we are, we're not dead. We're alive to Christ. But, and we've got all this back and forth. Are we dead to sin? Are we alive to sin? Are we dead to Christ? Are we alive to Christ? There's this Romans 6 conflict. 
And he says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we're in this fleshly contest and conflict with time. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? The next verse says ye are bought with a price. And so we're getting close to the end, but I want you to understand your time matters to God. Lastly, verse 10. Somehow we got to letter F. It's the focus. I wasn't focused when I finished these last two points. Verse 10, the focus. Let me tell you this. Biblical focus brings biblical clarity. I, I need glasses to see well. Uh, if one of the boys yesterday said, Dad, could, if he broke his glasses, he couldn't drive. And I was like, well, I can kind of figure it out during the day. But once the sun sets, everyone's going to die. Like, we're in trouble. So I need the glasses so I can see. We, we, we have to use this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We don't value. And I'm saying in general, if you are convicted by it, get right with God. If you're comforted by it, stay close to God. But I read my Bible this morning. Don't answer out loud. Did you read? Your, don't answer out loud. This is just you and the Lord. Did you read your Bible this morning? So what you're telling, if you said no, then what you're saying is you got up, you got dressed, you got in your vehicle, and you drove in L.A. County without even inviting God for safety. That's presuming, and that's wicked. Thank God he delights in mercy. But I'd rather invite him to the freeway before I get on it. So that, by the way, as this guy, he's driving now, and, and if, he, if he were to die in a car accident, I don't want it to be a day that I didn't go to God on his behalf. Job did not look in the mirror of his heart and say, I knew I should have prayed for my kids. God said, I, I pray for them all the time. They looked great. But I don't know if they, God, I don't know if their heart is right with you, so I'm praying for them. And when it happened, he didn't blame God. He didn't blame himself. You know what Job said? Blessed be the name of the Lord. How do you say that? Because he already was stewarding his time in such a way that it didn't matter if he was on the mountaintop or in the valley, going up or coming down. Blessed be, how do you say that at such a time? Because before that time, you were praising him. Before the tragedy, you are praising him. Before all of that, you are focused on him. Lastly, verse 10, the focus. In this, the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. And so we can see clearly. We just talked about this. I don't know if it was last week or Thursday. But we talked about them leaving us because they were not of us. But we're looking at that text. And uh, AC shared with me a, a little bit ago that there's one of his friends has kind of come full circle back to the Lord. And he, he didn't go extremely away physically. But in his heart, he just, just did it want to do what God wanted him to do, what his parents wanted him to do, what his family wanted him to do. He just was, you know, but I guess he's turning back. So why would he turn back? Because he was there. And he couldn't help it. The conviction finally got him and it broke him. But when you're not saved and you come to church and you, you're you not saved, you come to church, you get baptized and you're not saved, you read your Bible and you're not saved, you join the choir and you're not saved, you tithe and give to mission to give the offering and you're not saved, you share the gospel with other people and you're not saved and you walk away. The Holy Spirit's not in you to bring you back because you're not saved. None of those things save you. It is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The shed blood, repentance, all these things. It's what say it's not you, not by works of righteousness which we have done. 
So it's vitally important for us to understand we've got to have the right focus. And in verse 10, it lets me know that in America right now, there's people who are completely blinded. They think up is down and down is up. Why are they so out of focus? Because they don't know him. But they're not here this morning. You are. So do you know him? Do you know the Lord? Are you in focus? Let me give you this, and I'm done. We're approaching the end of the flight. These are five things that are not mine. I read this in my preparation and my study. Number one, how do you manage your time well? Number one, these are not mine. I have borrowed these. How do you manage your time well? Number one, start with why. Why? Why am I going to church on Sunday instead of having a yard sale with, when our family needs X, Y, and Z? Why? Answer that biblically, and I promise you, you won't do the yard sale. Find your why founded upon the Word of God. Why? Number two, set clear goals. Okay, this is my why. I need to be in the house of God whenever physically capable possible. Uh, my mom is a shut-in. She probably goes to church, I don't know, once a month if she can. So what she has as a goal is every Saturday, for the most part, unless she's having a horrible Saturday, every Saturday she's like, I'm going to church tomorrow. And then she wakes up and her body's like, no, you're not. <laughs> she can't go. And her husband, my dad, is the song leader at the church, the adult Sunday school teacher. And how many Sundays through the years my dad, he doesn't even ask him, he just knows by her body language if she's going or not. There's times where your body says, no, I get that. But your body is one thing. Your mind just going, it's hot. It's cold. The sun's out. It's raining. It's cloudy. Huh, it's Sunday. I don't want to go. What? And so when you make up your own mind, there's a problem. Go back to your number one. Why? Why would I even go to church? Go to the scriptures and answer the question, why? When you do that, okay, God wants me in church for sure. Number two, I want to set some clear goals. I'm glad way back in junior high I said I will never, ever, ever miss church. Now, I said that by faith. But fast forwarding this many years later, still here. And by faith, I'm not quitting until he returns or calls me home. Set clear goals with your time. Number three, make specific plans. So time. I am going to... Read one chapter a day, every day of my Bible, at a minimum. I have a pastor friend in Oklahoma who reads one chapter in the morning and one chapter in the e at night before he goes to bed every day. That has nothing to do with his devotion, and that has nothing to do with his study. He said, I should be in my Bible more. I'm already doing devotions. I'm already studying to preach. I need more Bible. I know what I'll do. I'll read a chapter in the morning when I wake up and a chapter before I go to bed. So he got his why. Because I want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. He set a clear goal. I want to read my Bible more. So he made specific plans. The morning and evening, a chapter a day. Number four, schedule your work. Schedule it. He didn't just say, I'm going to read one chapter a day or two chapters more. And never schedule it. It won't get done. Somebody said things that get scheduled get done. I laugh because I schedule all kinds of stuff that never gets done. But some of it gets done because i got a big schedule. A lot going on. But schedule your work. And number five, prioritize necessary rest. Got a call yesterday from someone right here in Bellflower that said, how do you do it? How do you do it? I'm married with two kids. You're married with 12. How do you do it? He said, how do you date your wife? How do you have time with her? I got a call from someone uh, North or South Carolina. Same thing. How do I spend time with my wife? I've got three little ones. How do I spend time? I don't know why they call me. They assume a lot. But what I tell them is, well, let me tell you what I do. No, I tell them what the Bible says. What's amazing is, this is so convicting. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. How do you not date your wife? How do you not have time for your kids? Christ gave himself for. So those are five things I got in my study. I'll leave you with the word time, and then we will conclude. The word is time, T-I-M-E. I'm not preaching this, but I just thought it would be good to chew on. I want you to be careful. Ephesians 5, 14 through 16 says this. Wherefore he saith, Awake, 
thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk. Does anybody know the next word? See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Here's four things and I'm done. These are warnings. Number one, letter T, time. Your time will be tested. It's a warning. You're going to wake up tomorrow and the rest of your day you're going to be tested on being a good steward or a wicked What is it? Unfaithful? Is that what he's called in the Bible? Unfaithful uh, servant? Unjust? Unfaithful? Unjust. You don't want to be that. So realize it's not like, okay, I made a decision. I'm going to be a good steward. <laughs> Great start. But you will be tested. You will be tested. Letter I. Part of the reason we struggle with time is we're indecisive. I like what Joshua said in Joshua 24. Choose you this day who you will serve. And then he said this, before you choose, ask for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was like, I have decided to follow Jesus. Every time I say that or sing that, I want to tell the history of that song. But that family gave their life. The author of that song, I've decided to follow, he gave his life on the mission field for Almighty God. Gave his life. Why? Because he decided. Though none go with me, still I will follow. He wasn't indecisive. I think I'm going to try harder. What? What? Either you're in or you're out. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Part of the reason we mess up with our time is we're indecisive. Decide. The word indecisive is unsettled, wavering, hesitating. Don't hesitate. The Lord is talking to you about your time stewardship. Do something about it. Letter E. One thing that will hinder your good stewardship of your time is movement. Specifically, the movement in fear. God says, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Oh, well, 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 well. And all of a sudden, we begin wasting time because we're living in fear, not faith. So letter M stands for movement. We move by faith, not in fear. Letter E, last one. Letter E stands for this, the biggest killer of our time in my opinion, is entertainment. Entertainment. We just want to be pigs in sloth. And we just want to fill our bellies with just whatever. And if you don't believe your flesh is powerful, then go on a diet for seven days. Just go on a diet. The three things you love don't help. Or if you're in good health, fast. Just fast. Well, I'm going to fast for three days. And we always have to say, because we're recording, get your doctor's approval. But other than that, the great physician will lead you. But fast. You want to see how weak your flesh is? For you big time coffee drinkers, just say no coffee for a week. See what happens. I'm just saying, your flesh is powerful and it loves to be entertained. And it's robbing God of the time that he's given you to give back to you. So as we continue on for the remainder of this month and next month on stewardship, examine your time. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the service today. Thank you so much.